Lord God, help us to trust that you are at work in our world, even when we don't always see it, even when we don't always understand it. And God, help us to be able to see in others the gift that you have placed to them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> So can we all agree that God is the creator of the world and everything in it? I think we're getting some nods out there. So what belongs to God? Everything, right? You belong to God. I belong to God. This church belongs to God. Frisco belongs to God. The world itself belongs to God. Pretty easy foundation point, right? So when we give to God thanks for God, that's everything, right? So, so where does Caesar fit into this of all this? Or the president, or anybody else? You know, I think that sometimes we, uh, we view things, we're, we're, we're shown to view things as, a, as an us versus them, you know, like it's a, a, a game. You know, I win, you lose, or you lose, I, you win, I lose. Um, you know, and, and I sometimes wonder if, if we've forgotten the very thing that the public are talking about, that we, we all bear the image of God. They all are a part of what God is doing in the world, and God can work through people who we least expect. And when uh, when Jesus asked the question, you know, so is it lawful? Is it lawful to pay taxes? Now, Jesus understands what's going on here. Um, and, again, Matthew loves the word hypocrites. Matthew uses that word more than any of, of the other Gospels. But, but hypocrites comes from the word for actor. So when we talk about a person who is a, a hypocrite, they're a person who is putting up a face of one thing, but doing something else. And I, I, I do think that we have a lot of people in the midst of the world who have forgotten what what their role is to be, and so what do they do in the midst of that time? They put on a mask. They act. They do all kinds of things. And, and again, it's so easy to get fall back into this us versus them because we see it all the time. We see it all the time in our culture. We see it all the time in our neighborhoods. We see it all the time even in our families sometimes. If you love him, you surely must not love me. And I think that we forget that you know, it doesn't work. Now, you know, Jesus in the early church could have every reason not to love, not to love Caesar. Again, not too long after this, this very conversation that Jesus is having, Jesus is going to be turned over to Pontius Pilate, and he's going to be executed, and he's going to hang on a cross. And, you know, Who's responsible for that? Well, some people will say um, the Jewish leaders at that time. Some people will say uh, the Roman Empire at that point. And both answers are partially wrong. So, you know, the, the people of God have always had this unique understanding when it comes to our place within society. Or at least... At least those who have reflected on it very deeply have. So we heard in the Old Testament today about um, Cyrus. So most people probably don't have any clue who Cyrus is. Um, so Cyrus the Great was the emperor of Persia. So modern day Iran. And so the interesting thing about this particular piece in, um, in Isaiah is that the title that Isaiah uses 
for Cyrus. Translated the anoint, my anointed one in English is Messiah. That's not a typical term you would hear somebody talk about for a foreign king or a foreign leader. Now, Cyrus does some good things for the Jewish people. He's the one who allows them to finally go back to Jerusalem to start resettling. And what Isaiah is making the claim is that, you know, Cyrus, you may not know who I am as, as God. You may not understand what I, what I am doing or how I'm at work in the world, but I have worked through you. Whether you know it or not, the world is mine, and you aren't doing anything without the authority I give you. Now, does Cyrus understand this? No. But God is able to work through, through a king who is not a, Jew, a Jewish person, who is not a, you know, Christianity doesn't exist at this point, not a Christian. God is able to work through them, to do something for God's people, but to do something for the world as well. You know, um, I'm going to guess that most people don't remember this part. Uh, this is this is from uh, Luther's explanation when we talk about um, give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. You know, when we talk about daily bread, God gives us the things that we need even without our prayers. God, God gives to both those who are good and those who are evil. God doesn't sit there and say, only the really good people are going to have enough to live. God says, I'm going to provide for this world because that's what I do. That's who I am. I love this world. And, and what does this world need? What do the people in this world need? Well, sure, they need clothing and food and drink and, and all these other things. And they need the relationships with their partner. But they also, and again, I think Luther caught on this, and Luther understood this from his time. They need upright and faithful rulers. They need good government. They need those things. Those are part of that life. And, you know, maybe that only works, and I, and I don't know how this works in every situation. So, you know, with the people who are in, in Palestine right now who are going through conflict, you know, I pray for them to have upright and faithful rulers. I pray for them to have good government, even though they may not be experiencing it at this moment. But I do believe this is part of what God provides for us. This is part of the world in which we live. And it's one of, one of the many things that we can, be, can go back and say, thank you, God, for it. Even when we don't understand it, even when we don't always see it. You know, Lutherans have always had uh, the, the aspect of being reformers, but not revolutionaries. And there is a difference in that. You know, we were never the people who wanted to tear, burn the world down and start over again. We were the one. We always came from that perspective. There is good here. There is something that God is at work here. And part of our job is to point to those things, is to bring those things out, and to build those things up. And I do think that in the midst of our world, we need people. We need people who can go and say, you know, this is what's good in the midst of the world. Here's where I see the image of God in the world. Here's where God is at work in the world. Or here's where I trust that God is continuing to be active in the midst of our world. And in, in the midst of that time, we still continue to pray, God, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Give us this day the things that we need. And forgive us as we forgive others. You know, there's a reason that we come back to the Lord's Prayer over and over again because I think it talks about, well, what is this life? So in the midst of a world that so often portrays it as us versus them, I think... One of the things that our faith tells us is now we get to look at the other person and it's not us versus them. We get to ask, who owns, who owns the world? Who runs the world? God does. How is God at work in this other person? Where is God's image present in this other person? And how 
How can I begin to point to them? How can I begin to be a part of what God is doing in the midst of this world? How can I point to the places where the good continues to grow up? It doesn't mean that the world's perfect. There's a reason we pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done, because it's not always done. It's not here yet. Yet, who owns the world? God does. And what do we owe back to God? Ultimately, 